Hi, I'm Mitch Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Jason Moore of Zywinks, who's going to talk today about security and best practices in FPGAs and SOCs. Is the problem getting worse? Is it becoming more difficult? The short answer is yes, it is becoming harder. The problem is becoming worse. And that's really driven by um, a number of factors. Uh, it's driven by the fact that we have divergent markets, which have divergent standards, which have divergent adversaries, not to mention the easy, easy availability of devices, high volume commercial products like ours, and also the longevity of our parts. Our parts are out in the field for 20 years in some cases or more, and that really changes the, the way you approach security. So let's drill down into this. Sure. So Jason, what are we looking at? Is with all of these different uh, markets, we end up with divergent requirements. What's interesting is, is if, you, if we were to kind of build a Venn diagram that describes the security requirements out of all of these different markets, there's no question there is a large body of security requirements that are common. And then, of course, as you get into the very specific market, you're going to get into the application specific areas, which then can become divergent in terms of the security needs. So from the standpoint of, of when you're designing these chips and when you're trying to uh, develop them and, and write software, what do you have to keep in mind for each one of these and how, particularly as the, as the markets start changing? Yeah, there are a lot of things that we want to keep in mind as we are looking at security across all of these different markets and a lot of these different segments. Again, there is a set of features uh, that are common amongst them, but we also have a lot of different standards that we have to look at and consider. It's not possible for us to be 100% compliant to each and every one of these. So there's a little bit of prioritization that, uh, that goes on. There's also a lot of work that goes on to find that area of commonality. And that's where we wanna be focusing uh, our investment into. When you think about the uh, different needs for each one of these, they're going to be fairly radically different. You think about a car, for example, they're going to be much more worried about a potentially a a nation state or a, uh, a, a well-funded uh, adversary versus a small consumer device where they're probably not going to care about it, right? Yeah, that's correct. There's no question that for all the different markets, you're going to get divergent adversaries. And I know these, this kind of um, graph has been shown many times within the security community. Uh, but on one end of the extreme, you're going to have you know, those, those adversaries who um, are limited in terms of their resources and capabilities. We refer to them as script kitties here. And then of course, at the other end of the extreme, you have the nation states. Now what's really interesting here is I've been at Xilinx for 20 years and there's a real trend that we've seen over all this time in that a lot of uh, the capabilities that our adversaries have are moving up and to the right. And not only that, because we support and work very closely with customers across all these different markets, one of the first things we'll actually talk to or engage with our customer about is what is the capability of their adversary? We want to know what they're concerned about. We want to know who they think their adversary is. And over the years, what we've seen as a very interesting market trend is a lot more of our commercial customers are describing what is listed here as either organized crime or nation state capabilities. Is part of this due to the fact that uh, in the past, the only thing you really had that was connected was the software and whenever it got updated, that's what you could attack. That was your attack surface. Now the attack surface is fairly significantly larger, right? And almost everything is connected. Yeah, there's no question that the uh, interconnection that you're referring to here, the connected world drives that. I think the other thing, and you kind of alluded to this, is that you know many years ago the FPGA was an interface chip. You know nowadays uh, it's the heart of most systems. Its capabilities, the SOCs that we have, uh, for example, the the Versal ACAP platform. There's so much that can be done inside of that platform. There's a lot more capability there, which of course that naturally makes it a target. And so I think when you combine the capabilities of the, the Xilinx SOCs with the connected world that a lot of our customers are in, that's why you're seeing um, the adversaries' capabilities you know, continue to move up and to the right. 
And in the past, when you dealt with a lot of the uh, designs, they were pretty much one chip. Now there are lots of chips, accelerators, all sorts of different heterogeneous components that go into these systems, right? Yeah, multiple components and multiple attack spaces, not only from the components like you're talking about, Ed, but also from now we have uh, hardware software together, right? And so um, those, each of those has an, a, diff a completely different attack space and, and you have to be worried about uh, all of that. You can't only be worried, I'm gonna put all my security uh, concerns into the hardware and then leave the software unprotected because the adversary will make its way in there. You don't wanna, you don't wanna try to limit your software, not worry about the hardware, the adversary makes, the, makes their way into the system there. So the attack space, no question has grown significantly. Are all of these devices always available? I mean, when you're thinking about an attack, you tend to be whatever's online, whatever's in use, how do we get into that? But reality is some parts of a device are off, some parts are on, some parts are just basically in sleep mode. Is there a difference in terms of the security on each one of those? Well, I think the, the devices, no matter where they're being deployed, when we're talking about Xilinx devices, there's not really a difference in terms of the, the base platform, right? It's the exact same device. Um, now what's actually being run on those devices, the customer's IP, uh, the functionality and the capability could be different, but the base platform, the foundation of the house, so to speak, is the same. And that's actually um, a, a very unique challenge that exists in high volume commercial products, right? So this slide is meant to try to address that. If I live, if I am a device manufacturer and I live in the far left-hand corner where the number of devices that, um, that, I, that are accessible to an adversary and the availability of getting those devices is low, um, there's enhanced security there just by definition that there's that less parts that are out in the industry and that's why it's shown as green. However, the simple reality is when you work for a high volume commercial manufacturer like Xilinx, you really live in the top right-hand side, right? So there's lots of devices to practice on. They're very easily accessible. And this gives adversaries the ability to practice their trade craft. And that creates a whole different challenge that uh, as a high volume commercial manufacturer like Xilinx, you have to worry about. What happens when you throw in some of the new uh, technologies, things like uh, AI, machine learning, uh, quantum computing, which uh, theoretically will be able to uh, uh, make most of the ciphers that have been out there are absolutely useless over time. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. The um, another area that we have to worry about is terms of a, a best practice. We have to think about how long are our parts going to be in the field, and what do we think will happen in the future in the advancements of security. And of course, that means you need to have a crystal ball. And I don't know of anybody that actually has one that works. However, we still have to sit and think about what are our threats going to be, say, 20 years from now. We don't build a product that's in and out of the market in three or four years. Our products are, have very long lifetimes uh, in, in a lot of different systems. And so you mentioned quantum computing. We need to be thinking about how do we protect against those kinds of threats, even though we're building a system now, but the threat may not materialize until 10 years from now, and, and that's a challenge. And in fact, we've seen that, that's, it, that's history, right? I'll give you a, a great example. You know, 10 or 12 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, the, the types of side channel attacks like differential power line analysis was being done by a small subset of a community, but now uh, every academic is, is doing different types of DPA attacks. Well, you can buy a scanning electron microscope on eBay now. This is, again, it, it's one of those cases where as adversaries and capabilities continue to, um, to advance, you know, we have to advance with them. I, I think I mentioned earlier, it's a bit like an arms race, and, and there's, there's really some truth to that. Jason Moore, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks, Ed. My pleasure.